Hello, aspirants. Looking at current affairs for 25th Jan, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 30. We'll look at them in detail. The first one, government unveils 2.1 lakh crore bank recapitalization plan. So we had announced that we had discussed that the government has announced recapitalization bonds. So now the further details have been provided. So this is 2.1 lakh crore recapitalization plan of the government for public sector banks. So this was announced already in October 2017. Now the entire reforms package has been detailed out. There are six themes across which the performance of banks would be seen for providing them recapitalization. So these six themes are customer responsiveness of the banks, responsible banking, increasing credit takeoff, credit offtake, then public sector banks as Udayami Mitra, then deepening financial inclusion and digitization and developing personnel for brand public sector banks. So this is the, these are the six themes. So this recapitalization plan or recapitalization package will be for two financial years, 2017, 18 and 18, 19. For this financial year, it has 80,000 crore outlay through two aspects. One is recapitalization bonds and another one is budgetary support. So this will be contingent as we discussed on the performance of the banks on the assigned themes and will be evaluated by the board of banks. Also, there is a differentiated approach for banks, means those banks which have been assigned prompt corrective, assigned for prompt corrective action, there will be a different approach and those who have not are different. And the bonds here which will be issued, these will have a maturity period of 10 to 15 years and will be issued in six tranches installments. And they will not have a statutory liquidity ratio requirement and they would be non-tradable as well. So, these are the details. So here further details are provided like what is this prompt corrective action to is discussed, what is SLR has been discussed. So here you can see banks which will get funding through this recapitalization as such are is detailed out. So prompt corrective action is banks which are having huge non-performing assets and the risk threshold is decided. So when they cross risk thresholds 1, 2 and 3. As they keep crossing thresholds, there are restrictions placed on them. So when risk threshold one is, uh, you know, breach, then it is there is restriction on dividends. Then more capital for foreign banks. So all these are there. And as the risk thresholds increase, the conditions also, you know, corrective actions required also increase. SLR statutory liquidity ratio is that part of the bank's deposits which is invested by banks in specific types of easily marketable means liquid securities under the provisions of the banking regulation act. So this investment is called statutory liquidity ratio. This ratio is fixed by RBI. It will change from time to time and it is maintained on a daily basis as percentage of net demand and time liabilities. So difference there is another ratio CRR cash reserve ratio. So cash reserve ratio controls liquidity in banking system and SLR regulates credit growth of the banks. So SLR, the banks can use gold, cash or approved securities and CRR is only in terms of cash and CRR is maintained in cash form with the RBI whereas SLR is deposited in government securities. Then next news item is Five-year jail term for Lalu in third fodder scam case. So this is regarding Rashtriya Janta Dal chief Lalu Prasad Yadav. So there are cases, fodder scam cases against him. He is named in six cases. Now the announcement has been done for the punishment for third fodder scam case. So a special CBI court in Ranchi has awarded him five years in jail and a fine of 10 lakh rupees as such. So this case is regarding fraud. By fraud withdrawal of 33.67 crores were done from Chaibasa. Now it is part of Jharkhand. The Jharkhand was formed as a separate state from Bihar in the year 2000. So this is the case of 1992-93. So this strict tragedy withdrawal which was done illegally and by fraud has been uh, called the fodder scam. So this was the money for fodder for cattle from which uh, you know, withdrawal was done. So Already there has been announcement of jail term for him in uh, another case in Ranchi. He is there convicted in this case for 3.5 years in this fodder scam, another fodder scam. This, uh, uh, this announcement was done in December 2017 and he is presently in Birsa Munda, central jail of Ranchi. 
So the first conviction, this is the third one. The first conviction was in the fodder scam case in September 2013. That was a jail of five years, but then, and he was also barred from contesting elections for six years, but he later got bail in that case. And there are three more cases in which he has been convicted. So there are six cases as such. Uh, sorry, there are six cases, three cases in which he has been convicted, six cases in which he is facing trial. So, three cases conviction has already taken place. So, this is the entire chronology of the Fodder scam, which surfaced in 1996. So, there are a number of people involved, around 60 people had been named, 50 accused people had been named in this present case also, in which the um, term has been announced. Then next is no Padmavat in Gujarat, Rajasthan. So there are still violent protests against Sanjay Leela Bhansali's movie Padmavat and Gujarat and Rajasthan will not see the screening because the Multiplex Association of India has been, has decided against the screening of this movie in the two states because of the violence here. Also it has decided that in two other states also Goa and Madhya Pradesh it would not be screened. The movie is regarding Padma, based on Padmavat, which is a book by Malik Mamad Jesse on the Queen Padmini and Raja Ratan Rawal Singh of Chittor. So the Chittorgar fort here also in Rajasthan saw protests by Karni Sena women members. So that was also closed for the day. So here the Padmavat, which is actually a literary work, an epic poem written in, in 1540 by Malik Mamad Jesse. So it's in Audi language and it's a poem, fictional poem, not based on the true events. It's a fictionalized version of the historic scene. This is actually in history. This happened. Chittor, Chittorgar Fort or Chittor was sieged in 1313 by Laudin Khilji. So he had heard about the beauty of Queen Rani Padmini, the wife of King Ratan Rawal Singh, Rawal Ratan Singh. And this attack took place in which Chittor was uh, you know, captured by Alauddin Khilji. Uh, but then Queen Rani Padmini and the women in the palace, they committed Johar. They gave up their lives rather than being falling in the hands of the enemy. So this poem is written on this by Malik Mama Jesse, a fictional poem called Padma. The movie is based on this work. Then next is submit time-bound action plan on Belinda Lake. NGT. So, the National Green Tribunal has asked the Karnataka government that it has to give it an, a time-bound action plan on how would it ensure that the Belanda Lake in Bengaluru, in Karnataka, which has been seeing severe pollution and has resulted in fires. There have been six such cases of fires. The last one was in, you know, Jan 19. So, it, the fire raged for 24 hours. So, what action has the government taken so far? Because again and again, there is fire in the lake. So, what investigation has taken place? The National Green Tribunal wants to know from the Karnataka government. The government responded saying that they had uh, conducted investigations earlier and they said the cause of the fire was accidental or intentional in some cases when the locals here entered in this lake to collect grass for cattle or and the dry grass was resulting in fire. But then the petitioners here, applicants in this case say that the fire here is due to froth which is generated in the lake, which is because of unregulated discharge of domestic and industrial sewage in the lake. So this froth in the lake has been in use too. So you can see this froth. So when you wash clothes, the chemicals in the washing powder result in froth. So such frothing is seen because there are chemicals released because of domestic and industrial waste in the lake. So, this frothing takes place in the lake. These are chemicals. And because of these chemicals, fires also erupt. So, the lake catches fire. So, there have been six such case instances of Belanda Lake in Bengaluru catching fire. Then next is Saras, the phoenix rises again. So, this is regarding 14-seater Saras, a civilian aircraft which had been planned by NAL, National Aeronautics Limited. So, this civilian aircraft was planned and put on trial too. In, the first flight actually was carried out in 2004. It was first conceptualized in 1990s. So, it was for short-haul civil aviation. 
so this saras named after the indian crane the bird saras this aircraft program of nal actually resulted in tragedy in 2009 when the crash took place of this saras prototype in which two wing commanders and one flight test engineer was killed so after that there was funding was stopped for this so for the project sanction monetary sanctions did not come and the funding because of funding in stop the project could not take up could not continue but then later it has been seen that csir has also given council for scientific and industrial research has also given a go ahead to the saras project and now flight tests have a plan to begin again the first prototype new prototype flight test took place so this was the first flight trial of saras the 14 seater civilian aircraft which has been indigenously built by nar national aeronautics limited which had its test flight done successfully right so this is a saras project the next is hpv vaccine gets immunization nod so the national technical advisory group on immunization which is an advisory body has recommended hpv vaccine under india's universal immunization program so this is a green signal given to hpv that is human papilloma virus vaccine so this actually decision of which hpv vaccine will be used for this immunization program will this be decided based on the supreme court decision so there is a case going on in the supreme court since 2012 so in this case actually there are two hpv vaccines which are available in india one is developed by merck and another one by glaxo smith kline also there is one indian form developing an hpv vaccine which is un presently undergoing clinical trials so it's not available in the market so this 2012 petition actually was signed in which it was asked that the licenses of both merck and glaxo smith kline be removed because there was not adequate clinical trial done for them so this has been the present status the controversy is actually of 2009 because a clinical trial was conducted by an american non profit organization pat in partnership with andhra and gujarat government but then there were 24000 pre adolescent girls who were given these two companies vaccines hpv vaccines you should know hpv vaccine is for treating cancer cervical cancer so for you know, preventing cancer so these out, out of these 24000 girls eight girls died so this resulted in health activists claiming that path and others had violated research ethics by giving this vaccine to the girls without informed consent of their parents so that is why india also has high burden of hpv related cancer 67000 women die from this disease each year in the country and even this is more than india's maternal mortality rate so but then this is a case because that took place in clinical trials so out of the two which vaccine would be used in universal immunization program is still not clear world health organization and even global advisory committee have given the said that this vaccine is safe so also many activists claim that there is no need for this hpv vaccine because even screening for cervical cancer alone can prevent many deaths right so this is regarding the entire sequence of events as we discussed the gates foundation was the one which funded this you know vaccines study of these vaccines to the clinical trials so these vaccines were donated by glaxo smith kline and merck then this is regarding the human papilloma virus which causes cervical and cancer you know there are different types of hpv and out of these 30 types are transmitted by genital skin to skin contact and 15 of these are oncogenic means cancer causing so in india also the incidence is high and this is regarding the universal immunization program the vaccines which are provided under this program in india so bcg vaccine for tb tuberculosis hepatitis b oral polio measles even rota virus vaccine has been added even pneumococcal vaccine has been added presently measles rubella vaccine etc now hpv will also be included in this vaccination then next is will biometrics help fight crimes as supreme court so supreme court is questioning in this aadhar case hearing that the state the state means the government is accessing personal and biometric data so whether this data is necessary to combat terrorism and crimes such as money laundering is been questioned by the supreme court 
So such are the questions which are being framed so that answers can come to it. Senior advocate Kapil Sibal representing the petitioner said that at present a citizen has to part with his personal data and biometrics but he doesn't know how the state was using them and whether or not these were safe in the hands of the government or not. But then the, another judge compared uh, this state surveillance to Google Maps. So Google Maps also has, knows it's not a state, it's not a government, but then it is tracking people. It's an application that is tracking people. So here also the person is giving an inf difference is that, you know, person is also being tracked, not by a government, but by a private entity. So difference, what is the difference between a person giving an informed consent and opting for services and being compelled to do it is being highlighted by the petitioners. This is there because here you are compelled. You can you're not giving your consent, but you are compelled to part with your personal information and biometrics. That is the petitioner's argument on other. Then next is center determined to stabilize population growth. So UN World Population Prospect Report has stated that India's population will equal China's in next seven years. But the government says that we so slow down the growth of population. Around 24 states and union territories in the country, it is said, has achieved total fertility rate. So the total fertility rate of India is 2.1%. So, so actually, total fertility rate, you know, the, the total fertility rate target of India is 2.1%. Total fertility rate basically means the total number of children born or likely to be born to a woman in her lifetime. So, you know, so this in India, the DFR to be achieved for population stabilization is 2.1%. So, if this is the total fertility rate, then population will keep replacing itself. There will be no growth in population. So, this is the target to be achieved. 24 states UTs have achieved this target of 2.1%. But then there are 7 states and 146 districts identified in these states which have high TFR and government is going to initiate programs, plans for them like using contraceptives, providing them contraceptive devices, medicines, counseling, family planning. You know, even there are, there are social barriers, institutions will work to dispel doubts on this also. So this is the plan of the government put forth. So this is total fertility rate also explained. Number of children who will be born alive to a woman during her life. So it's a you know statistical data. So 2.1 percent means not 2.1 children will be born. Of course, two children would be born. But this is for statistical purpose that TFR is calculated, which needs to be achieved. Then next is. India ranks 177 out of 180 in Environmental Protect Performance Index. So, Environmental Performance Index 2018 has been released and India is among the bottom five countries. So, this data is produced biannually by Yale and Columbia Universities and this was released during the World Economic Forum Summit and India's ranking is quite low. In air quality, it is ranked 178, overall 177 out of 180 countries. So, air pollution is a huge concern. The top country is Switzerland. So, this you can see. This is the 10th environmental performance index report given. So, there are 24 performance indicators across 10 categories on which ranking is done. China's rank is 120. India's rank is 177 out of 180. So, here the based on air performance index countries are shown. You can see India scores very low. The next is. Three killed in Islamic State attack on Save the Children Aid Group's Afghanistan office. So, gunmen stormed the office of Save the Children Aid Agency in Afghanistan's Jalalabad district and battle security forces uh, which were surrounding the building. Three people were killed and 20 wounded. Islamic State has claimed responsibility for this attack. Here in Jalalabad, an aid group Save the Children outside its office is attacked to this by Islamic State. Then next is bilateral visits set to deepen China-Japan ties. So China-Japan are looking for long-term engagement. So the two countries the exchange of leaders also leaders visiting each other. Japan had uh, given ahead its uh, strategy called free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. So this was seemed initially to be targeting China because of its policy, you know, maritime assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific region. 
to freedom of navigation of the sea we have seen so this japan's policy now is being said that japan will cooperate with beijing to meet the growing demand of building infrastructure in asia so it is going to cooperate on obor one belt one road a belt and road initiative of china so cross border infrastructure initiative will be supported so this china and japan are also coming together now here you can see this was free and open indo pacific strategy region as such where japan is interested and this is china's belt and road initiative the land route and also the maritime silk road so overlap is shown here the next is udan 2 to link 73 airports helipads so now the udan scheme that is the regional connectivity scheme of the government the second phase of it will be launched and 90 proposals have already been you know uh, so this will be for 73 unserved and underserved airports and helipads so this will be the phase two so uh, actually the, what has been targeted is that the uh, rate at which you know airfare is charged should be 2500 per hour so around 2 lakh such seats would be there per annum so this are expected to be provided even through helicopter operations in the first time that bids have been received for helicopter operators as well so government provides them viability gap funding too that for the project to become viable whatever extra funding is required is provided by the government and this government funding is coming through this levy regional air connectivity levy which it charges on all airlines flying on major routes so all unserved underserved airports are connected using this levy so there is a rupees 5000 levy which has been charged on airlines so this money is used for the odan scheme but now the government says we will not increase this levy anymore we will be using also the dividend that airports authority of india pays to government of india so this dividend and this levy would together fund the odan too so this is there so this is the regional connectivity scheme detailed out here Then next is the last one, tea growers seek help to fight climate change. So the tea industry in the country wants the central government to help it fight climate change which is affecting the tea crop output. So small tea growers are also increasing otherwise there are large tea estates. Well, the small tea growers who grow tea on less than an acre presently account for 44% of entire tea sector. So they are requiring irrigation facilities and they also want assistance on replanting because presently old tea bushes means old old tea bushes means those are those which are more than 50 years old account for around 38 percent of the entire area under cultivation so the age of bush will will be directly linked with the yield so there is need for replanting also so that's why they are seeking assistance from the government they are, this, uh, they are demanding income tax reductions which are being done those should be limits should be removed on them too so they need support for investment as such too. Also, they have suffering from heavy crop loss due to reconsidering instances of hailstorms, frost, rain and droughts. So, climate change is also affecting the crop. They require crop insurance schemes also from the government. So, these are the demands from the tea sector coming forth. Also, for uh, organized tea industry, the social costs are quite high because they are mandated to provide housing, medical, portable water and subsidized rations to the plantation labor workers. So they also seek direct tax relief because of these expenses. In respect of GST also, they are asking for removal of anomalies which are affecting the exporters. Also for value added export like for tea bags, industry is seeking concessions on filter paper, you know, nylon cloth etc for making tea bags. So before the budget, these are the concessions being sought by this sector. Here the details are provided, year wise how much production and export takes place. So in geography also sectors, sectoral development is also there. So this is regarding the T sector. So these are the news items. Thank you.